Uh, day, everyone, and um, welcome to the thesis defense for Edward Leon Guerrero. My name is Don Rubenstein. I'm Edward's chair. The other two members of Edward's committee are Dr. Michael Bivacqua, who is with us, and Dr. Mary Cruz, who is coming from class. We're expecting her. That was why we had a bit of delay. We were expecting her. Um, we're expecting her any minute. Uh, also, we just had a surge um, at UOG and uh, internet connection, so um, we're kind of scrambling here. Uh, the uh, title of Edward's thesis is Mespipia y Fino Chamorro among non fluent young Chamorros on Guahan, exploring language revitalization, ethno linguistic identity, indigeneity and Chamorro activism among non-fluent Chamorro millennials and Generation Z. We'll give Edward 40 minutes for his presentation. Uh, following his presentation, the um, three committee members will have some questions for him. If we have time, we'll also open the floor up for questions from other members of the Micronesian Studies faculty. I see a few who are participating. Following those questions, the three committee members will retreat to a breakout room to discuss the results of Edward's thesis presentation and our advice for him will rejoin the main room and will announce our decision. That will conclude the public uh, phase of the thesis presentation. While the committee is deliberating in the breakout room, the public audience is welcome to ask Ed any questions they might have or, or just to chat while the committee comes back. And um, so I thank all of you for joining. Uh, I'd like to briefly introduce Ed and thank him for giving me this uh, uh, short bio. Edward Leon Guerrero was born and raised on the island of, Gua of Guahan to the tremendous parents of Paul and Lola Leon Guerrero. While he spent most of his childhood time in the village of Maiti, he often was dragged to family gatherings in the villages of Hagatnia in Alahan and Maleso. He graduated from Harvest Christian Academy in 2013, and in 2016, he received a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and sociology from the University of Guam. As a UOG graduate student in Micronesian studies, Edward has a passion to spread free and digestible information about Micronesia and its moral language to the community. He notes that his passion has been realized through Pulan Speaks, an educational channel found on YouTube, and he invites everyone to check it out and subscribe. Figures that inspire Edward include Cho Lai, Edward Said, and Asma Mahfouz. Edward, you have the floor. You have 40 minutes. Go ahead. Right. Thank you, Sidus Masi, Don, for that tremendous introduction. And, you know, I could spend the next 40 minutes acknowledging all the people who have helped got me here so far. But, you know, for the sake of time and because I want to get my committee on my good side, I would like to have everyone acknowledge them and give them a virtual round of applause for Dr. Donald Rubenstein, Dr. Michael Bivaco, and Dr. Mary Cruz, who's not here right now, but just one round of applause for all of them. Okay, so now... I shall begin and I have a tremendous slide prepared. Let me share that on the screen right now. Okay. So as Don said, my, the title of my thesis is Umespipia y Finu Tsamoru among non-fluent young Tsamorus on Guahan. Foreign language revitalization, ethno-linguistic identity, indigeneity, and some more activism among non-fluent Samoa millennials and Generation Z. So just right there in that title, there is a huge number of terms which I will eventually define for all of you. But for now, let me begin with a dramatic pause before I begin. So I will first start off with telling you about my overview. And so it's going to be divided into three sections. The first section, what's important, is going to tell you about the introduction, the statement of the problem, and so on. 
And then we have the research questions, the purpose, and the key concepts. And then the second section will tell you how was this done? And that includes the methods. Then finally, the last section three, what did we learn? It includes the results and discussion and the implications and recommendations. Okay, so. All right, so for the introduction. So, you know, it is no secret that the Chamorro language has been exponentially declining with each subsequent generation. Studies that looked into the possible reasons for the decline generally associate the effects of colonialism, a culturalization, and modernization as the root causes. While many studies have either explored or touched upon the processes to how and why the English language has replaced the Tsamoru language as the lingua franca anguam, None have analyzed the Tsamoru language in the context of Tsamoru identity, particularly amongst the newer generations of Tsamorus. These Tsamorus grew up without the Tsamoru language. So what the Tsamoru language means for their Tsamoru identity is speculation at best, as there has not been a comprehensive study on this subject. So for this thesis, I specifically targeted millennials and Gen Zers for three main reasons. First, as already mentioned, studies have looked at some identity not focused on this demographic. Secondly, the vast majority of millennials are at a young adult age and having children of their own. So it becomes important to understand their perceptions of the Tsamoru language as they begin to pass on their understanding of Tsamoru identity and attitudes of the language towards their children. Lastly, as a Tsamoru millennial myself, I am interested in how my generational peers perceive Tsamoru identity and the language because as a Tsamoru activist and language advocate, I have a deep desire for my generation to become fluent in the Tsamoru language. By understanding how Tsamorus articulate their Tsamoru identity in relation to the Tsamoru language, we can understand the processes of Tsamoru identity rearticulation and the political, the economic, the ideological, the social, cultural, and the historical forces that guided and actively shaped the boundaries of contemporary Tsamoru identity with an emphasis on the Tsamoru language amongst the youth. So the Tsamoru language is one such boundary marker that is the focus of this thesis, which reveals how Tsamorus negotiate, contest, and resist such forces. As implied by these words in the thesis statement, such as rearticulation actively, shape the boundaries, and negotiate, this thesis takes a constructivist theoretical approach because this viewpoint reflects the wide social scientist scholarly acceptance of the constructivist concept of identity. As such, the following questions guide the thesis. For the sake of time, and because I want you all to read the thesis, I'm just going to read two of the research questions. The main one is, what are the forces that construct and actively shape the ethnolinguistic identity of non-fluent Chamoru millennials and Generation Z? And for the next one is, how should the Chamoru language revitalization project move forward in 2020? I have a total of nine research questions, but I shall move on right now. So the purpose, what is the purpose of this? The purpose is to, for one thing, it's to explore how young Tsamorus articulate their Tsamoru identity with the language and to understand those historic, those social, cultural, and those forces that have constructed Tsamoru identity. It is also to inform language advocates, teachers, and policymakers into how to move forward with the Tsamoru language revitalization project. And lastly, on a more purpose, a uh, more uh, personal note, a purpose is to sensitize some people who decry the youth for not be able to speak the Tsamoru language. 
to inform them that many of these, that the reasons why we're out of our control and that saying hurtful things such as you're not Samoan for not speaking the language does more to prevent a young Samoan from learning the language than to encourage them. And now I'm going to go into five key concepts which are crucial to understanding my thesis. So, Samoan identity. There are probably as many definitions as Tomoru as there are Tomorus in the world. And this is due to the nature of Tomoru identity as a social construct, at least from the constructivist stance that this thesis takes. So Tomoru identity, it's constructed, fluid, and subject to change like all other identities. So following in the spirits of Norwegian anthropologist Frederick Bach, Rather than focusing on the content of the social group, we should focus on the boundaries. So what is important for Tsamoru identity is that there is a subjective sense of distinctiveness between Tsamorus and non samorus This is not to say that ethnic boundary markers such as language are pointless because these are important tangible markers that contribute to the sense of distinctiveness. Therefore, there is no one essential quality that makes or breaks Samoa identity. Authenticity is another complex concept that goes hand in hand with Samoa identity. Authenticity, it's a main driver for why some people feel more Samoru by speaking the Samoru language and vice versa. For this thesis, authenticity is understood as an ideal that people strive for in the process of change. It refers to the culturally agreed upon ideas as to what is considered the ideal. Ethnolinguistic identity, it's a term used in linguistics and it refers to a subjective feeling of belonging or affiliation with a social group that is defined in terms of a common ethnic ancestry and a common language. And I use this term especially to put in focus the sense of Samorus to maintain their indigenous language. Language revitalization. It refers to preventing a language from going to extinction. And I want to emphasize something very clear, that language revitalization is not merely for the sake of saving the Samoru language because our heart desires it but because it is also very political. In fact, the Samoru language revival went hand in hand with the political and indigenous Samoru renaissance in the 1980s, which centered around identity politics. So revitalizing the Samoru language is a way to mobilize Samorus to achieve a sense of nationhood and maintain a distinct cultural identity within the organized, unincorporated territory of Guam for political purposes. And indigeneity is a concept that allows Samorus to argue that by virtue of being indigenous to the Marianas, Samorus have special rights that other ethnic groups do not have on Guam. It taps into the international discourses of indigenous rights and appeals to human rights to make a moralistic claim for these special rights. And so I got, here's my method section. As you can see here, I got semi-structured interviews, my sampling, measuring criteria, the data collection, sample description, data analysis, so on. So, the reason why I use my semi-structured interviews is because it gives me uh, flexibility when in interviewing the participants. I was selective in my sampling, only choosing non-fluent Samoru millennials and Gen Zers. Uh, determining if the participant was Samoru was by self-identification. And their language fluency became self-evident when I tried to speak uh, Samoru to them. So I was able to tell who was fluent and who was not fluent. So 
And my interview questions, they were very open-ended. For example, I would first ask, well, what does it mean to meet some more? And go on from there, leading the participant uh, back to the topic or question if they go off topic. And, you know, I have to say, I, I really regret doing this because transcribing all these lengthy interviews took a tremendous amount of time and it was very, very painful. So anyways, I used an expensive USB microphone and an iPhone 6 or 7 uh, to record the interviews on the program Audacity. So starting in March 14, people were interviewed. So in total, there were 14 people interviewed and the mean average age was 23. So the youngest participant was 18 and the oldest participant was 31. So after, after the painful process of transcribing, I coded the interviews that analyzed it. And you can read my method section for a detailed explanation on my coding process because this is very technical and time consuming right now. And so for the ethics, of course, I got IRB approval uh, consent from participants and I use pseudonyms in place of the real names to hide their identity. So the limitations, it includes of course my pro-language bias which may have influenced responses to be more favorable to the language. Also the, as I only interviewed 14 people, the results are of course not generalizable but that's not necessarily the purpose. And I also unintentionally prompted the respondents by telling them about my thesis, by informing them about the project. So this may have influenced their responses because I informed them that this project is looking at language revitalization. And so they might think to themselves, okay, so I'm now prompted to now say only good things about the language. Okay, so now let's finally get into the good stuff, which is the results and discussion. So how young Samoru's view the relationship between language and Samoru identity. So the typical young Samoru, they articulate their identity, mainly in terms of everyday customs and values, such as respect to fiestas, going to church, and for many of them, this excludes the Tsamoru language speaking as a critical aspect of their Tsamoru identity. And this reflects their reality as Tsamorus growing up without fluency in the language. However, young Tsamorus generally still see positive value in learning the language, as well as a uh, connection between the Tsamoru language and Tsamoru identity. I also identify that Samorus who believe the language to be a critical part of their identity seem to almost always have gone through an experience that caused them to question whether their identity as Samoru could be fully realized without some knowledge of the Samoru language. And so this experience leads to what I call an awakening stage from the typical Samoru identity as I previously described through the process of identity rearticulation. And so the exception to this, of course, is Samoru's raised in a non-typical Samoru household where the language is already used daily and that these Samoru's are raised to already value the language. And so while I found that Samoru's who included Samoru language ability as a critical part of their Samoru identity are more likely to actively learn the language, they are nevertheless inhibited due to external factors that affect all Tsamorus, no matter how they articulate their identity from actively learning Tsamoru. And one of these main external factors that inhibits all Tsamorus from learning Tsamoru is the utility value. Or, in other words, the usefulness of the Tsamoru language for social and economic gain, which the Tsamoru language unfortunately strongly lacks. So, I know I just said a lot, so in order to understand everything I just said, 
I created a tremendous figure amongst the relevant codes, the categories, and themes to visualize the processes of Tsumuru identity articulation with the Tsumuru language, which may lead to language learning. So here is the beautiful chart, as you can see right now. As you could clearly see, if you look at the bottom left, you could see the category reasons inhibiting actively learning Samoru. And you could see the arrow is, a, is inhibited because of, and it's pointing to actively learning Samoru. So what this, what this visualization here suggests exactly as I described it is that no matter what type of identity articulation you have, you will still be inhibited no matter how much you believe the language is critical to your identity. And it's due to those factors. Now in my thesis, in the actual written paper, I describe this in full detail, but that will take way too long and way too much time. So ask me for a copy afterwards. And let's move on to the next significant finding. And so the next significant finding is, is deals with young Chamorro's indigeneity and activism. And so here's the thing we need to understand. Or actually, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Or actually, yeah, claims to Tsumoru in-group membership. Let, let, yeah, I, I mixed the order up right there. So let's first go to claims to Tsumoru in-group membership and authenticate Chamorro identity. So one thing we have to understand about this is that from my participants, these Tsumorus, they thought of their identity in terms of approximately nine attributes, which are blood slash genealogy, practicing cultural values, knowledge and understanding of cultural values, knowledge of history, being raised in a, or living in a Chamorro lifestyle or culture, language ability, living in the homeland, ethnic consumerism, and personal feelings of self-identifying as Samorus. So these nine attributes, so Tsumorus, based on my participants, they either invoked, emphasized, or de-emphasized one or several of these attributes in their understanding of Tsumoru in group membership. So most Tsumorus hold the belief that individuals can claim the Moru identity without speaking knowledge of the language. Even amongst many of those who believe the language is critical to Tsumoru identity. So overall, Tsumorus prefer inclusivity over exclusivity when defining Tsumoru ethnicity, particularly when it comes to language ability. So, until more Tsumorus become fluent and use the language, it is unlikely that language fluency will be a major marker of Tsumoru identity. Instead, I claim that other aspects of their conceptualization of Tsumoru identity, uh, such as uh, uh, blood, the genealogy, values such as uh, respect, uh, familia, and so on, even personal feelings of self-identifying as Samoru are likely to act and continue to act as major markers of identity for Samoru millennials and Gen Zers. Even though on social media, the Tsumoru language is the prominent marker of Tsumoru identity for young Tsumorus. And now another significant factor, or significant finding actually, is that young Tsumorus make common sense ontological assertions about the connection between Tsumoru language and people. And this is consistent with uh, nationalist ideologies. So it lays a natural uh, sort of linkage between ethnicity and language. And so Tsumorus, uh, this essentialist beliefs about their identity and their culture it leads them to desire to protect their language 
for psychological and political reasons. And so these essentialist beliefs often come into contact with the uh, linguistic reality is that they lack Samoru language fluency. And this often causes ambivalence. And so language revitalization efforts, it reflects the larger socio-political battle for Samorus to maintain their cultural and political prominence on Guam in the face of demographic changes, Americanization and uh, globalization and so on. And these force the threat to the position of Samorus because they impose uh, liberal multiculturalism and American ideas of equality and politics. And this stigmatizes ethnic-based politics and mobilization. So Samoros challenge these ideas and combat marginalization by uh, using the concept of indigeneity in order to maintain this Samoru social, cultural, and political order. And so our arguments based on indigeneity allowed Samoros to tap into these international human rights discourses and it allows them to view and, and these international human rights discourses they argue that indigenous peoples have the collective human rights to maintain their way of life in their land with the borders or under the hegemony of states so although Samoros in general may not be able to articulate the political development of indigeneity, these arguments are from indigeneity are self-evidently made by Samoros to explain why they are a unique ethnic group on Guam and therefore deserving of pro-Samoru uh, policies. So as such, Samoros use these uh, indigenous-based arguments to argue specifically that the Samoru language, culture, and land ought to be preserved, revitalized, and perpetuated by the government and community. So, for example, some, some examples said by the participants were like, hey, the Samoru language, it's the language of our ancestors, it's the language of our land. Therefore, we have to promote this language. We can't let the language die. And I also tested this too. For example, I asked one of the participants, well, don't you think it's a little unfair that the Chamorro language is getting all this promotion by the government? What about Tagalog? And immediately, the participant said, well, no, why should Tagalog get promoted by the government here on Guam, by the community? because they already have their own homeland in the Philippines. You know, we could barely have enough speakers of Samoru as it is, so why promote Tagalog? And that right there is a clear case of arguments of indigeneity being used to promote the Samoru language. So I know I said that it's used to promote the Tamaru language, it's used to promote these cultural policies, but however, it is only to an extent because several young Chamorros from my participants, they do not use this indigeneity argument to the extent that some Tamaru nationalists do to argue specifically for control of immigration and Samoru self-determination. And I speculate, I believe that this is because young Samorus are either ignorant of the issues, they're less educated and therefore, you know, are not quote unquote radicalized by other nationalists, or they perceive that Samoru nationalist positions to be discriminatory or even racist. And this perceived connection between the Samoru nationalist position and discriminatory slash racism is ideologically shaped by the power relations between the United States and Guam. So as a colony of the United States of America, and because Samorus are U.S. citizens, Guam and its residents are subjected to the liberal and multicultural ideologies of the United States. 
These young Samoanus, my generation, we were brought up on a culturally diverse island. And we understand diversity within the framework of American multiculturalism and equality. And also the media reinforces this connection and ignorance amongst the people of Guam through the lack of news coverage on the potential harms that these ideologies could potentially have towards the Samoru people. And through the, and through the promotion of such ideologies, naturally some young Samorus are uneasy and skeptical about these Samoru nationalist positions because they perceive them at least initially as violating these underlying assumptions. However, for Samorus who have, quote, awakened, usually through education, they tend to resist these dominant ideological tendencies on Guam from the standpoint of Samoru nationalism. And now another finding based on examining the Maori revitalization language case is that Samoru language revital, uh, revitalization, that Samoru language revitalization project, it failed due to many factors. So it's due to Samoru's lacking a strong Samoru indigenous and ethno-linguistic identity. Many Samoru strongly identifying with America. Too many Samoru's are satisfied with the status quo under American rule. And also there is a relatively lack of federal support for language revitalization. And that Guam has a weaker economy that is, that is sustained. You know, that is a lot, a lot of it is sustained through United States federal spending. So, you know, we can't exactly allocate scarce resources to language revitalization efforts. It's not a priority. And so, and also, uh, the, there was a late emerging educated Samoru class and they did not link the language to national identity. So as, and this is a direct result of you know, of Guam, that Samoru has been colonized for over 400 years, which is about the longest of any Pacific Island people. Not only that, but the experiences of World War II and the liberation of Samoru from the Japanese occupation tied Samoru identity and political aspirations to America, to that framework. And so this discouraged popular support for any semblance of radical Samoru nationalism the local ideology of English as the language of success with the accompanying shift from a subsistence uh, to a cash-based economy led to a decreasing use of the Tsumonu language in the private and the public sphere. Thus, the priority of Tsumonu, mind you, Tsumonu controlled government of Guam and the typical Tsumonu person was not necessarily language maintenance or language revitalization, but rather economic and achieving the American dream. So then, what are the implications and recommendations? So, you know, the fact is, and, and, this, and this is sad, but this is based upon, you know, how I interpret the data from the implications and recommendations, is that Samoan language revitalization, it's an incredibly difficult path. And as this thesis is arguing and implying, and you can read it and see the more of the details, it appears nearly impossible, and it's due to the social, political history and current political conditions of Guam. And so, you know, I recommend that Chamorro policymakers, we must reorient the language goal to maintaining a small multilingual but slowly expanding language community. As I argue that anything more is too ambitious, it's impossible without a limited political power. Because in order to navigate this multicultural and social political order, policy makers, you know, they must not make any overt policies that will have a 
true effect, which is to increase the economic utility of the language, as they might receive incredible public backlash, and this would possibly kill any effort. You know, and of course, I recommend that the Guam legislature could start allocating funds in gradual increments towards language immersion programs, as this has proven to be the most effective, it's pragmatic way of increasing the number of speakers amongst the youth. And so I will say this, and I'm part of this demographic that older second language learners such as myself, we should be a lower priority for government allocation of resources because as my research showed, the vast majority of these individuals are inhibited from actively learning for those very social economic reasons, as my, according to my theoretical model. I also suggest, and, and again, this was a suggestion, you know, is that if there's any resources available, any spare resources available, is that it should go to the next generation of elites, that we should we should allow them to learn the Tsamoru language. Meanwhile, pre-existing educational resources and grassroots efforts such as, you know, nonprofit Tsamoru classes, the amazing, you know, what, what uh, Dr. Bivakwa does at, at the Republic of Java uh, Cafe and what I do, you know, with Poulan Speaks, you know, these online materials will continue to support us, us demographics who you know, who strive to learn the language. And to me, this is probably the most realistic solution that I believe that Guam can achieve under the current conditions. Again, I'm assuming that. Because I would say that the maintenance of a sense of Tsamoruness, the maintenance of the Tsamoru social, cultural, and political order, and the promotion of the well-being of Tsamorus are, in my view, more important than the actual speaking of the language. And again, this is coming from someone who dedicates himself to the language. And so for now, we must focus our efforts on our potted taro plants than on trying to recover an entire field of dead, salty taro patches. Seduce Masi, everyone, for listening to my 35 minutes uh, thesis defense. I now stand ready for a cross examination. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. That was uh, beautifully done. And uh, I'd like to now invite. Um, Dr. Cruz, uh, if she has any questions, uh, welcome, Dr. Cruz. We uh, started a few minutes before you got here. I apologize for that, but uh, welcome. Sorry for my tardiness. I, I scheduled the defense um, wrong in my calendar. Um, sorry, Edward. I have, okay, so my first question um, to Edward is, you refer to yourself and your interviewees as typical Chamorro millennials with typical Chamorro experiences. Can yes. you explain why this is significant to your overall research design and yes. how an atypical Chamorro millennial with atypical experiences might have changed your conclusion? Because you acknowledge the, the limitations that it has. Yes. So, so how so might this have changed your conclusion? So let me go to my tremendous chart. Eric, could, I, could everyone see it right now? Here, let me go to my charts. And this could explain, this will help explain, this will do a tremendous job explaining it. Okay, from the beginning. Okay, chart, how come you're not working? Okay, what is going on? Hold on. Okay, where is it? Okay. So my typical uh, Chamorro uh, identity and the typical Chamorro childhood, you know, you know, re really, you know, if I, if I could have clarified that better in the coding, I would have said the typical Chamorro identity in terms of language exposure. And so this, and so this deals with the idea of Chamorros in a household who were mainly exposed to English. So 
I mean, me and pretty much I would, again, I would speculate like 90% of other Samoru millennials and, and uh, Generation Zs who are younger than the age of 30 or 20. You know, we experienced a, we experienced a household where most of the exposure we had was to the language was basically not really any, we were mainly exposed to English. English was our native language. And so in that sense, we grew up in this reality where the Chamorro language is, you know, it's not part of our everyday sense. And, and you know, and the factors which cause this, which as I explained, you know, the, the colonization explained the, the World War II, the experiences of World War II. And so that leads to, to our generation to not believing that Chamorro fluency is a critical aspect of Chamorro identity. Although we will still say that, of course, Chamorro is important for Chamorro identity uh, due to the, to the effects of, show of socialization. And so, and, but again, we still share those same reasons that whoever, that no matter what, identify as the same reasons why we desire to learn the language, which is one big thing, some more identity authentication. And so then to get to the next part, which is the atypical Chamorro childhood, okay? And so this includes, you know, these unique experiences that I would say are atypical, which is, you know, which are outliers from the rest, which includes, for example, family members who spoke to the participant only in Shamoru. Although I, I didn't interview anyone who was fluent in some, a young person who was fluent in Shamoru, I do know several young fluent speakers in the Shamoru language. You know, one of them defended their thesis uh, just three days ago. And so they were raised in a household environment that was atypical in the sense that their family members or someone kept speaking to them in Samoru, and so they were exposed to the Samoru language, and therefore they they were already had a understanding or identity of fluency, particularly as a critical aspect of their identity. And so, you know, in that sense, you know, they didn't necessarily need to go through this this awakening stage or all of that because they already articulated their identity in in that sense with the language from the way beginning, particularly language fluency. And so there's also various outcomes because as, as I, as you know, due to time constraints, I could have explained this more, but as I explained in my, in my written thesis copy is that this, this could all, there's, there's like basically an infinity number of different rearticulations and which depends upon, you know, your childhood experiences as well. So, you know, for example, someone who was raised in a, who was raised in a typical, one of my participants, who was essentially, she claimed that she was raised, you know, in a, in a ranch her entire life, that many of her family members around her spoke Samoru, and that many of the people, and that, you know, she didn't necessarily, she was homeschooled, and that in her sense, in her conceptualization, she already considered language fluency a critical aspect to her identity. And, and that participant was Jennifer, which is a pseudonym in my thesis. And not only that, but not only that, but she also considered aspects such as farming, such as ranching, as especially critical parts of Chamorro identity. And so I reasoned that the reason why she considers those a critical part of her identity was because she was raised with these values surrounding surrounding her. She was raised with this socialization of this particular form of Samoru identity. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes. Is that okay? Um, of course. Do you think a more positive outcome could be achieved if the awakening stage happened sooner? Like, like, could you could you clarify that again? So you talked you talked about um, um, how your interviewees came to some of these um, perspectives. If it happened sooner in their life. Do you think that the outcome would be different? Would it be would it be um, more positive towards mm. the language revitalization? Oh, so so that's one thing. So here here's the interesting too. What I what I, what I what I should mention as well, you know, is that is that these awakenings, right? They they appear to be happening earlier, you know, like in high school, and and you know, and I would 
I would argue that this is a reflection of the of the Chamorro ethnic. Uh, I mean, the Chamorro uh, Renaissance, which happens in the 1970s and 80s, which keeps carrying on, especially with Fest back in 2016, is that these experiences that happen in high school, it's it's now happening earlier. These awakening. Now, whether it's having a, a positive, of course, you know, it, I would say it would have more positive attitudes towards it. But as Underwood said in his 1989 article, which is that these positive sentiments, you know, it doesn't necessarily lead to language, language, uh, language uh, learning. And also, here's one example of a participant who actually had an awakening when they were young in high school. They had an awakening when, when he was young in high school. And so he believed that the language was a critical part of his identity. So he spent then the next couple of years trying to learn the language. But then, but then as this model here shows, he had another experience. And then from that experience, he was like, wait a second, the Chamorro language, it's actually not that critical to identity. So he rearticulated his Chamorro identity into no longer believing that Chamorro uh, language speaking is, is a critical aspect. So we could easily have that, you know, shift back. So, you know, of course, I would say that, that if, it hap if this awakening stage happens when participants, when Chamorros are younger, it will, of course, have a more positive effect. But, but as the theory holds, as this model holds, is that these positive attitudes, it doesn't necessarily lead to a desire, it doesn't necessarily lead to actively learning Chamorro because due to those external factors which affect everyone, Thank you. Mary, anything else? Do you want me to go through my entire list or do you want to take turns? Uh, if you have one or two other questions, we could do that and then we'll move on to Dr. Bamakwa. Okay, okay. So um, Ed Dunn, my, my next question um, is in reference to the issues that you discussed regarding language revitalization. Um, as it right, relates right. to immigration and decolonization. Right, right. right. Um, and you, you, you kind of put this in a context of what a national identity would look like. Right, um, right, right. But in your, in your, I mean, in your thesis, you um, suggest that a multilingual ethno-linguistic identity is, is recommended. Absolutely. Can you expand on why you recommend this as opposed to a monolingual ethno-linguistic identity, um, given some of the challenges that you discussed in your presentation? And I want you to speak about how um, you think that this would not uh, further perpetuate the status quo, given the complexities of what we already understand to be um, the competing American Chamorro identities. Wow, that that was a tremendously long question. I'm but sorry. I, I, no, I just can, can you break it up? But but let me let me let me start first I, I and guess tell just, me then. Just then, speak then. about speak about yeah, no, why you're recommending no. the multilingual ethno linguistic okay, okay, identity good, good, good. as opposed the, the, to just one solid. We know what this right. is, right? Right, right, and 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 you know, I take these ideas from uh, from the social linguist uh, Joshua Fishman. You know, in doing this thesis, you know, I, I read pretty much 90% of all his works. And, and he mentions this, and, and I also look at his J.S. Jews, such as Olivia Garcia, another prominent linguist. And so, so when we look at this idea of a multilingual, is, is that the idea is that, you know, in the, in the modern world today, due to the globalization and our participation in, the, in a cash economy, you know, is that languages are now, is that we're now becoming hybridized in the sense that we have our ethnic identity, this home language, and then we have a more national or an international language. And so it, it has come to the point where in fact this this colonized this colonized language or this foreign language has has an is in fishman's word, it's been nativized by the people using it, or I, I would say indigenized by the people using it. So English is, so in particip so it's also a pragmatic approach too, because in participation in the, in the modern world is that we're going to have to, we, 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 are, we are forced to use the English 
we are forced to use this language because it is the way to have participation for economic, for social, and for the political uh, role in the world. Because without that, it's going to be very difficult. And not only that, but I look at the the reality of of most Chamorros because following the model is that you know most Chamorros we we already speak English. You know, trying to create a a mono, a mono a linguistic identity that is defined only by the Samoru language, I would say, is is would be incredibly difficult and would and would have so much backlash uh, amongst even Samorus themselves would have so much backlash. And I would ultimately also say it's it's impractical because if all, all the all these other groups are are utilizing these new multilingual hybrid identities in their in their daily life you know for example you have for example many people such as the you know the zulu people you know they speak you know the the national language there but amongst many competitions you have people in uh, burkina faso they they have their indigenous languages but then they speak french as a national language as a way to unify the people and so also that the english language will not serve not only to that it's already here it's participation in the international world and the world economy but it's also a way to get include everyone else in the picture here for non-ethnic uh, non-ethnic samoans who don't have that sense of authentication by learning the Samori language and this is a crucial part because if there is an idea of building a sense of a a Samoru nation, or, or in this sense, including also, if we're if we're going to describe this nation in the sense of a of like Turkey, this Turkic idea, where hey, if you practice this language, if you get these cultures, you are now considered Turkic. You know, if we're having th that type of Samoru uh, nationalism, a more inclusive form, you know, is that then then you know we're going to have to bring in all these other people in the fold, or if not, then you know I'm afraid that there could very be will. A reaction by promoting a single mono uh, ethnic uh, lingual tongue, which we might have, you know, ethnic conflict. Which, when I study that in 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 other places, you know, it, it's very, very bad, very bad. The things that happen due to these nationalist aspirations to try to homogenize people under one language. Okay, so um, one last question. Okay. Um, you provide some great suggestions for, for the future in your last chapter, but in, I'd say, uh, two to three sentences, if somebody off the street says to you, Ed, based on your research, how integral is language to identity, what would you say? Two to three sen sentences. Two to three sentences? Yes, keep it short. I want to know, I want to know if you, like, let us... For me let us personally or for my, for my political, for my radical political vision? What, what, based what on are, your research. <laughs> well, based, well, based upon my research, it, it turns out that that language is, it's actually, it's actually the act of speaking the language is not, it's not as important as I previously thought. You know, because I had this previous, this warfinist determinist view, which is that, you know, language, you know, determine, you know, thoughts. But it turns out that, you know, based upon my research, that's incorrect. So I actually shifted my view from that. Okay, so, two to three sentences. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cruz. Uh, let me uh, turn it over now to Dr. Bavakwa, if uh, you have any questions, we get. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, could, you okay. say, Don? could you speak a little louder? It's, it's hard to hear. Sorry. Dispensa. Sorry about that. Um, go, go, Dahui, Bosmu. Oh, yeah. And so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Edward, for doing this project. Um, I think it's, I think it can help. As I've mentioned to you before, I think it can help us to understand some of the gaps um, in sort of the literature on issues that are important to us. Um, so I did want to sort of ask you one thing that I found very interesting. Uh, because so um, when we've spoken to about your thesis, you know, one of the values in it is that as different generations have tried to address the language sort of uh, the language issue, They've produced different materials. They've created different programs. They've uh, worked on different types of strategies. Right. To, 
And so one value that I think that could come from your research is that, um, is that it can help us understand sort of the, the most likely group to pursue learning Chamorro, which is a young Chamorro or a young person on Guam. They may not necessarily be Chamorro because there are a number of non chamorros who also are interested in learning more Chamorro. Right. Um, and then sort of understanding where they are at in their process, where language learning might fit into their lives, what right. strategies might be good to give them tools to learn, to increase the chances that they would learn, to increase the chances that they would learn more. Um, but so then I was very surprised, though, that in one of your recommendations, you were arguing that the Chamorro Language Commission should be empowered uh -huh. and that they should continue to standardize the language to yes. the, the diversity in the language. Yes, absolutely. Now, so one of the reasons that I found that to be very strange, though, is because the approach that you're overall taking, though, to kind of understand where young people are at, though, um, it kind of, it doesn't quite match with that, though, because from my perspective, sort of a, a language commission has certain roles and certain purposes, but rarely in most communities is a language commission involved in language revitalization because the language commission is, has a certain goal, but it's not necessarily about getting people to speak the language. It's about deciding what's appropriate, ruling on issues. Right. So then from that perspective, um, that's because as we've talked about before, the spelling issue is one which I would argue has, has decreased the number of people and that are learning the language, decreased the number of people because uh, what it does is it decreases the possibility for the transmission of the language between generations. Because older speakers encounter this issue where they don't know how to spell, where they're feeling the oppressiveness of a regime which is telling them that they don't know how to spell correctly. So their feelings of insecurity around perhaps lack of education, mm -hmm. lack of right. knowing quote unquote proper formal tomorrow. And so I was wondering why then you would, um, because from coming at it from somebody who, so throughout all of your uh, all of your interviews, the key in terms of their of of, of many of their re relationship to the Chamorro language was whether it was used around them, you know whether they heard it growing up, whether it was used around right. family, and so I was I wanted to hear no, more about why you would encourage a strategy which may be good in the long term, but actually inhibits the transmission of the language now. Because as you have probably felt in your own family, and as I hear from so many people trying to learn, the focus on spelling only decreases the chances that an elder and a Chamorro speaker will use the language with somebody who is younger and interested in learning. Right. That, that's, a, that's a tremendous question. Fantastic. And, and yes, no, no, you, th this was a dilemma I was struggling to uh, throughout the writing of my thesis, which is, which is this idea of on one hand, you know, uh, the standardized language, and then on the other hand, that w which, which does potentially, and it actually does, it inhibits many people from uh, the, the intergenerational transmission of the language. But, but the reason for why I promoted this particular view is that because, as you mentioned, you know, I, I want to see this in a long-term goal because I already seeded, I already seeded that in the current conditions, the, the language revitalization project should only be focused on the taro, on the taro pot plants, in, you know, that's in your local garden instead of trying to go out in the field and recovering that field. So this is a long-term strategy because I believe that the dividends of a standardization process, you know, would, would pay in the long runs tenfold because if we don't do that now, it's still going to be a ticking time bomb and we might as well do it now that we have this wave of, of excitement to learn a similar language because, because if we, because as, as I said, you know, this, this is a ticking time bomb which will continue to cause conflict in the future. And as you know, as I, I study other cases like the, the Italian uh, language standard, standardization, you know, I study the German uh, language standardization, I study many, even, even Mandarin and the standardization with the simplified is that these are also key themes to building some more nationalism. One of my key things too is to the, the uh, social, cultural, and political order. 
and by standardizing the language and you know with the spelling although there will be a hurt in the short term in the long term scheme of things i would say it's absolutely worth it if we're if we're going by the criteria of a of Just, promoting a smaller multilingual uh, community. So the, the issue though with that there is that um, the, 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 the major difference between the examples that you just mentioned there is of course the size right. and the language infrastructure involved. Right. And so as I've told you before is that uh, you can't compare sort of those, those models to what happens in Guam. Because in Guam, the language, it's not, it's not an issue where you have a bunch of people speaking different dialects of a language, but they're right. going to keep speaking the language, whether or not they spell it right. So that, but what happens here is that the language is declining and the language transmission is declining. And I would argue that a big part of that is the focus not on the speaking of the language and the using of the language, but the government's right. focus on the standardizing of the language which alienates the speakers of the language to not pass it on to the youth. So, um, and, but that then leads me to, uh, to sort of a, another issue uh, to sort of think about. Um, the relationship between language and ethnic identity, you talked a lot about it in your thesis. Right. Um, no, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's good, but one of the, the things to think about though, is that you seem to, it's so, in looking into the future, will the, will the language continue to be an important part of the Chamorro culture? Or will it continue, and Chamorro identity, or will it be something which is more ceremonial, as we see in some mm. other cultures, in which sort of the, the form, of the indigenous language is primarily used for ceremonial purposes or or it's tied to class communication or particular sort of spaces of life, but it's definitely not the dominant mode. Right. And so that's why when you were talking about sort of the long-term strategy, I'm not necessarily sure about that because given even what was in the data that you found, it's very, very likely that Chamorro language would, would become uh, very soon, it could become very soon, to the equivalent of a necklace. Right. Or it could become the equivalent of sort of a t-shirt. Right. You know, you, uh, what's it called? That you buy a, you buy a Fakai shirt and then you use a couple more words and that they are kind of on the same level. Right. And, and I it, argue that that's what's happening on social media. Well, yeah. And so, but, but so that's why, that's why um, I was surprised at some of the recommendations and some of the ideas that you put up there because they seem to, to be pushing further in that direction rather than seeking to halt it because one of the main things that your research points to is that it's not necessarily, at, at least in this point, it's not necessarily like a lack of, of programs or resources. But what is, what is the problem right now is just that speakers are not speaking to non-speakers in the language. Because languages are transmitted because they're used between speakers and non-speakers. That's the, that's the way that they're transmitted. There's factors which come into play in which a language may be seen as being a more valu a valuable asset to a, to a community. There may be issues of pride and ethnic association with the language, but it just comes down to somebody who knows it uses it with somebody who doesn't, usually somebody who's younger than them. And so, um, so that's why I was, um, in your recommendations, I was thinking because your, your data seems to provide so much about that truth. Right. So I was wondering why it wasn't more prominent in your recommendations. Mm. And, and I, I, right. Go, go on. Just because, Sorry, dispenser. Just because looking into the future, when the, let's say, for example, at, very soon it's likely that uh, within a generation or two, many of the first language speakers of Chamorro will be gone. And right. And the second language speakers who will take over. Um, right. But so I was, I was hoping that you would, given the direness that your sort of data showed, that you would make recommendations which were more for in the moment in terms of creating more of that intergenerational contact in the language, in the target language. So that, that was a lot. That was a lot. And so what is your response to all of that? 
Okay. <laughs> well, well, again, you know, the, the response is, is first, you know, I, I've considered exactly what you were saying throughout. And, and that's why when I made these recommendations, you know, that's why it, it hurt, it hurt to really make them. But, but I consider from, from everything I read, read from the data, even other theses, for example, uh, Tamar Sellis's 2017 master thesis, she, she recommends the same thing that you said, which is, which is to connect older people with uh, the younger Samoros and call it the little elder program. And in fact, Underwood actually mentioned that same exact thing uh, two decades ago. So, so that program was already recommended. And so I didn't feel like that I need to recommend something that has been already uh, said in the, the literature already. I want to come up with a, with a new idea. And so, well, and so, and, and, and Edward, the, the fact that it was never implemented though, is, right. is, is evidence for part of your argument. Right. Because the key in your argument is that idea, that disconnect that we've talked about before, where there can be a strong positive assertion of something, but there can be little to no impact on the behavior of a person in regard to that, right? It's like people right. who say that they want to save the earth, but they don't want to recycle. Right? It's, so it's a, it's a very normal thing, but it has to be understood. Because why is it, and, and that's why to my initial question about the strategies that are used for language, because what I really want to impress upon you and push you to do is think about how what you have found would impact how the language could be transmitted in this moment. Because, um, because it's, something that, uh, it's something that past generations and the current generation struggle with, is there is this idea, you know, there is this idea, um, you know, so why is it that in, 19, uh, in the 1970s, they created a program to teach the language in schools, um, but they didn't create any programs in the community? Why is it that they didn't create any of the sort of the, the master apprentice or sort of the, those sorts of programs that have been recommended over the years many times? So that is also part of your argument. That's also something that you can address. Why is it that sort of there is this... Is it, um, and so why do you think that sort of, that, that uh, creating an elder sort of youth program like that, that it was never implemented in Guam, even right. if it was suggested 30 years ago? Right. And, and, and I put it back to uh, what I said in my, my other point, which is it's due to the, the unfortunately, the social political history uh, here on Guam, where, where the Tsamoru language, it was not prioritized in that sense. And going back to the, the theoretical model, you know, the, the elder program, something like that, which would require uh, funds, which would require planning, which would require, you know, resources, you know, you know arguably, though, I, I said as before that the government of Guam, it, it wasn't necessarily a priority. Now, now the language is getting more, more of a priority, but it wasn't necessarily, I don't see how how it could have been implemented 30 years ago if they didn't implement these same uh, school programs that, that the Maori did or, or, what the whole, or what the native Hawaiians did. And so it, it's difficult to, to say that, that we could just to, to make like these short-term recommendations when these current factors that, I, that I've talked about, such as the inutility, are just so powerful you know, and that the social political history that has shaped the thinking of the language, they're just so powerful that, that for me, it was hard to suggest something that has already been suggested uh, a couple of times before and was not implemented. So it's like I'm repeating a broken record in that sense. And of course, I believe no, no, that if, uh, right. Cop out, the cop out, because if it was never implemented, but if, it's a, if it is a viable solution, then you have to address the issue of why it was never. And it's, and right. because I would argue that because the focus was always on institutionalizing the language in a certain way, putting it into a classroom, it furthered sort of the feelings of colonization and alienation around the language. Because the language belongs in the home, that's where it usually starts. It strongly tied the culture, but even a lot of these moves meant to save the language. I mean, the perfect example of that you can see is that for many of the people who are fighting to 
to save the Chamorro language in the 70s and the 80s, many of them were not using the Chamorro language in their homes with their own children. And so, so that's why, um, so that's why if you, if you continue to recommend those, if you, that's why when I saw your recommendations, I saw a strong disconnect between your data. And so I wanted sort of to, to get you to think a little bit more about that because in your Kulan Speaks videos, you are creating content, no, you're creating content which is more in line with your data. Whereas what you recommend at the end seems completely disconnected. It seems like you're just trying to be like very academic about it. And so, but the issue may be that it, may, it, that it needs to be taken out of the academic context and taken into a more grounded level. Um, and so to your point of the lack of utility of the language, we see that in several different cases, um, that the utility of a language is not a universal thing. It's not something that is determined by, by any sort of deity. The utility of a language is something that a community creates. And so we can see that very, we can see that very effectively in the bilingual bicultural program. Because that was created and then because it was institutionalized, it, it provides for between 100 to 200 jobs every year for, some, for people who speak Chamorro fluently. And it is the role of a community to and, and a government to create the utility of something, to create possibilities for that. And your data shows that. Your data shows that people, that, that they lack the feeling that it is out there, that it is in the world. And part of that, though, and you do recommend those things, though, so that's good. But you don't take it to that next level, which is that, it is, that the utility is not something which is determined by our past. And it is not something which is completely determined by global tendencies. That the utility of something is, is partially determined by a community's interests. And so that if you were to, and one of the reasons why the bilingual bicultural program was institutionalized is because it provided jobs for old people. Because the old people who started it when the grant money ran out the, the, the program went to the legislature and said, can we just, can we keep these people on because they're having fun, they're doing great service to the community. And the legislature said, sure. And they found the money so that they could stay employed. So, um, so to that issue though, I would encourage you not to, not to sort of see it because I noticed that um, in a lot of the ways that you talked about utility, you were echoing the, what your subjects had said, but that you don't have to do that though they may feel that there's no utility to it, but you can see the larger structure. And you can see that, that actually the utility is partially dependent on what the community decides, not that the community is stuck with a worth, worthless language, but that if you, and government usually has the largest role in it. Sometimes entertainment industries are very big in determining the value of something, uh, but usually it's government. But so I would encourage you to sort of uh, think more about that though. And uh, so anyways, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Oh yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I, I, I wrote in my thesis that the, the number one determiner of, of whether a language gets revitalized or not is, I got this from Olivia Garcia, which was strong language policies. And so, yes, I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. And, and I consider that, and, and I might need to consider that more since, you know, since you're, you're, you're helping me think more about this, you know, rather than my, my view of, of the, my previous thoughts. And so, yes, no, absolutely. Government, I, that's what I put up, uh, that strong language policies by the, by the state or the government is probably the, the best way or the best way to uh, revitalize the language. And so, I think what needs to be understood is that in my recommendations, it, I was looking at based upon the, the current uh, social, social conditions, you know, and, and to me, these, these social conditions made it difficult for me to, to recommend the, the things that, that you're talking about because, because of these, these uh, because of the external uh, factors and because it, it just, to me, it, it was just hard to, uh, I, guess, I guess I was being a little too pessimistic in that sense then. Maybe I need to uh, be more optimistic. I should go and talk to Dr. J probably. And so, you know, things like that. But, 
but yes, I, I, I understand what you're saying and, and I will greatly consider that and I will relook through my work and try to incorporate uh, more of what you're saying and to, and to stop having this, this, uh, this one dimensional view of uh, something like determinism. And, and good work though in the data collection and yeah, you put together a thesis with lots of things to talk about and lots of things <laughs> that need to be said. Thanks, Dr. Rubafa. I see that we have uh, four members of the Micronesian Studies program, uh, four faculty members. So I'd like to ask if any of them have any questions, uh, starting with our program chair, Dr. Todd James. Sure. Uh, by the way, very well done, Ed. Very impressive. Thank you. So I just have a simple question for you, Ed. So yep. what was the most difficult thing about uh, doing your research? Oh, do, do, do I have to be honest or? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, ideally. Okay, the, the most uh, honest, honestly, the most difficult part was transcribing. And like, I wasn't joking when I said that was the most painful thing I've ever done because, because my, my fault was doing more open-ended questions. And so some participants kept going and going for like two hours and transcribing that was the worst experience of life. And that was the closest I ever thought about quitting because the mindless work of transcribing was just so crushing. Okay, thank you. No, no, thank you. you're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? So we also have um, Dr. Ann Ames, uh, who's with us, and all right. <laughs> hi there, Ed. Hi. Oh, hi. Wonderful, wonderful job. I'm so impressed. You were such a delightful student. You always. Oh. Every time I saw you, would say, "I'm going to do it. I'm almost there." I just have a a few more things to. Uh, to fix. So congratulations. It's a really nice project. Wow, you thank you. Uh, very beneficial to the area that you are interested in. Uh, one quick question. Was there, what, what finding were you not expecting? Oh, the was finding I was not expecting. Oh. You went, wow. Okay, okay. That, that, wow, that, okay. Hold on, let me, let me think about that. Okay, per permission to think about it, Dr. Uh, Annames? <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that's a good one an unexpected finding okay let me let me think about real quick uh i i, I guess one one of the the biggest unexpected finding was that at least in, in my based upon my theoretical model is that you know is that it doesn't matter whether you believe the language is super important to you or not that super important but you are still inhibited by these these factors which inhibit you from learning so so for example i, I talked like three of my, the participants i talked to they they were tell they were like crying when when i was interviewing they were telling me oh my gosh the language means so much i'm so sad that i can't speak it and so on they were like i was like whoa and yet you know and yet they, they they're still not able to they're still not putting an effort to actively learn the language and and that the reasons are are same throughout no matter how a person perceives some more language so to me was that was the most uh unexpected mind-blowing finding and again this is based upon the theoretical model based upon the interview data okay great well job well done Uh, two other Micronesian and Studies faculty are with us, um, Carlos Madrid and, and uh, Mike Clement. Um, Mike, do you have any questions? Mike, you're muted. <laughs> hey, uh, congratulations, Ed. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a lot of work you did and really impressed with your work ethic. Uh, you know, I wish I, I, wish I could have... Uh, Read read the uh, thesis uh, to give you some some closer feedback, but um, 
you know, you're, you're actually, you're tackling a topic that is, um, you know, one of the, the big issues of, of the last 50 years, 60 years. And, right. uh, you know, how, how to come up with an approach to revitalize the language to get it part of everyday life um, is, 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 is not an easy uh, problem to solve. So, you know, the, the fact that you're working on this is, is, is great. Uh, collecting data, uh, getting a perspective, especially from your generation. Um, you know, I congratulate you on, on, on getting that down there. Um, you know, because you know, as you know, I, I looked at this issue in the, the 60s and 70s and um, how Chamorro language music was part of, uh, in a way, a campaign to revitalize language that um, in, in, in the big scheme of things wasn't, you know, completely successful because the language declined uh, in that period. But um, the more studies we have uh, looking at different aspects and of, of the challenge of uh, keeping the Chamorro language alive and, uh, you know, uh, how it's different for each generation uh, is, is a thing going in the right direction. So um, I don't have any specific question for you, uh, but, but congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, Carlos. Uh, do you have any questions for Edward or any comments? Um, thank you, Don. Um, I would like to to thank everyone for for the, for me for the opportunity to be here, Edward. Uh, congratulations for your work. It's 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 clear to me that you it's something uh, it's a topic that is very relevant for you. Uh, that is on a personal uh, it touches you on a personal capacity, and that you have been devoting uh, I have a num number of of hours of work into collecting the data. Um, if, if there was a question I would like to ask you is, with this data that has been collected, are you gonna be expanding it after, after, this, after this decision? Are you gonna be continue working on it as, uh, as you may have uh, mentioned during the, during the defense? Mm, mm. Oh, oh yeah, definitely. Like, like what, uh, like what uh, Dr. Michael Bivakwa uh, suggested, I'm going to do as he suggested and, and re-look at my recommendations and probably recommend uh, more suggestions in line with like such as what he said, like, like that elder program and, you know, looking at these programs and more, I guess, more putting into more detail the, the nuances into, into what we could do right now as opposed to what I was trying to do with my, my, uh, my thesis, which was trying to give a more long-term uh, projection. So, so that's one thing I, I plan to do uh, after the defense. Thank you. Mucho gracias. Thank you. I'd uh, like to um, invite Dr. Johnson, uh, who just sent me a chat, a chat message that he wanted to ask a question of you, Ed. Thank you, Don. <clears throat> Congratulations, Edward, for getting to this point in your journey. Um, it's incredible to kind of witness how this trajectory that you've been on as entering the, entering the campus as a freshman, the courses that you were taking and the, and the steps that you were, you were pursuing. I think you have... I've never had a student like you. Um, there's not ever been a student even close to you. You, uh, in terms of how um, unique this drive has been in you and this um, incredible determination that you've had uh, to walk the walk. Um, and, and I really enjoyed the discussion that, um, that you had with Dr. Babakwa and, um, and I, I value um, the contributions um, that you are making and the listening ear that you have um, to those that have been so closely accompanying you, like Dr. Bavakwa. Um, what is on my mind, Ed, is as a, as a young person here on Guam that um, came into the language as an adult um, and and pursued it um, academically as well. Um, if 
if you could just give me and others some insight into what drove that? What were the experiences that you had um, that compelled you in this direction? Um, in the face of great odds, um, and it, it's been incredible to see how even your peers, your classmates, have, um, have had such admiration for that constancy of effort, that determination. Um, and um, like Dr. Dr. Madrid said, how much effort and work that you have put into not only this research, but, but over the course of many years now, um, this path that you have, um, that you have walked. So, what is it that drives somebody like you? What, um, with all the forces against you, against that drive, with so many distractions um, on a personal level as well as a societal level and culturally mm -hmm. and all of, the, mm -hmm. all of the forces that are awash in your life and washing over your life, what is it and what can you say to a fifth grader and a 10th grader and a freshman coming into the university that might have this interest, what, um, what continued to allow you to progress? Wow, wow. The, uh, don't lose seduce Marcy for those, what, what you just said. Wow, that was very beautiful and very moving too. And so the, the, this is going to sound crazy for everyone listening right now, but I would attribute one, the reason why like, I have this flaming desire, this drive that once I, I, I set my mind to something like such as learning the Chamorro language, even though you know, as, as you remember, Dr. J in the Bali class, they, I, would get, I would get laughed at and so on. Right. It, is, is that one of the, it, it, it goes back to actually my, my schooling at Harvest because I, I know it's crazy because Harvest, as if you don't know, Harvest is a, is a right-wing conservative uh, evangelical school. And so while there's many things about Harvest which I, which I disliked in, re in looking back in retrospect, one of the things that I really appreciate was their constant hammering in me, this constant hammering of, of this idea that of individual responsibility, that you are in charge of your destiny, no matter the odds. And, you know, of course, now looking back, you know, I, I, you know, I see, oh, maybe that's sort of a, a naive view. But even though you know, understanding more of like the social uh, factors that may cause someone to, to accelerate or to not, you know, it's still, I still think back to, to those days at Harvest and that drive that they instilled to me. And so, and so developing that mindset in Harvest of this individual insatiable drive to that if I want to do something or if I need to do something, I do it. You give zero excuses and you give 110%. And so that environment at Harvest, that, that, that was a real good environment uh, for me to develop that. Because uh, truth be told is that when, when I entered uh, University of Guam, I, I carry that with me. And, you know, there was also a point at the University of Guam where where like, you know, for, for like a semester or two where I started, you know, slacking off and going with the flow. But then I snapped back uh, right into it. I realized what's happening to me. So now I, I give myself no excuses. I always try to do my best for everything. You know, even though this thesis project will probably just sit in the, the library at, at the mark, you know, and no one will probably ever read it. But the point is, is that I give my all to everything that I do no excuses and it drives me and so and yeah and that that you know i i wish you know if i had it my way i wish i could do a thesis project every month because it, it's just such a focus and such a you know i get i get like a high off of this off of like doing things like this too and so and yeah and and regarding people who you know who laughed at me who said ah your chamorro is funny ah the senior fuminu house moto uh, often, uh, you know, often that you sound like that, you know, to me, that just motivates me even more. You know, every time someone says that to me, I'm just like, oh, wow, you know, that that's fuel for me. So that actually makes me, you know, motivated even more. So if you want to motivate me, tell me I'm terrible at something and I'll do the complete opposite, you know, and maybe that's just me being, uh, 
uh, uh, proud, too proud or something. And, you know, I don't know. But, but to me, that, that, that's just how my, my mindset works. So I would attribute the harvest. And I also like to attribute to my, my family. I have a tremendous family. You know, my, my mom and dad are good. I'm, I'm close to many of my cousins too, my first cousins. And that also plays a big role in it too because they, they help me keep me grounded. They help me keep me humble, you know, relatively speaking, and, and so on. So I got a loving family. I, I got that drive from harvest of that individualism in me, you know, and knowing that, but I also had great professors along the way, such as, you, Dr. J, such as you, such as Don, such as Dr. Mary Cruz, such as Dr. Michael Bivakwa or Miguel, or as I jokingly call him, Che Bivakwa. So all that. And yeah, and I don't really worry about what people think of me too. You know, that life's too short to worry about all that. Yeah, well, I Edward, that. I, that's helpful. Thank you, Edward. That helps me a little uh, understand you a little bit further. Um, right. What I would, um, and I, I don't have to hope this, I know that, um, that you will be doing this. Um, I think um, having you um, in spaces here on Guam um, with, with your peers and with those younger than yourselves, as well as older, in the community, in educational settings and the like, I think um, there's now a responsibility on your shoulders to have these conversations um, with young people um, who are also um, having these questions, having um, these struggles. Um, and so it would be wonderful to have you continue to come back to our classrooms at the university, as well as to think about connecting with your, with your, school, with your original school, but others as well. Um, middle school, high school students, different um, teachers, really, um, being able to um, welcome and embrace others into the journey that you yourself is on. I think it'll be helpful um, for so many of us. Um, and just, again, you've been a great inspiration to so many of us. And uh, I, I really um, for, have a lot of gratitude in my heart for the efforts and the, and the struggle and the journey that you've been on. It's really been inspiring. Thank you, Edward. Okay. At uh, this point in the thesis defense, um, the committee members will uh, move into a breakout room. So I invite all of you to continue chatting with Edward for the next 10 minutes or so. And then the committee will move back into the main room and we will announce the results. So um, Troy or Maria, if you could put us into the breakout room now. <laughs>